Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for, for coming this afternoon. This is our second uh, public information session for the Home Arp Allocation Plan. I'm Andy Feaster with Development Strategies, and I've been um, helping the city with this process since about June. And so we want to uh, provide a quick overview of what Home Arp is, uh, who can use the funds, what they can be used for, uh, the process we went through to determine the needs and, and gaps and the recommendation of the plan so far. Um, we have revised the recommendation based on some feedback from um, city leadership and we want to explain what that is and get, get your feedback. So what is HOMARP? Uh, the city received this five and a half million dollar grant um, from HUD um, last fall and HUD requires this allocation plan process where we had consultations with a number of organizations who do work um, in the homelessness and at risk of housing insecurity field. We did a needs and gaps analysis uh, and presented kind of initial thoughts and findings to city council. Uh, we're now in a public comment period where we have a draft of the plan um, published and we're receiving public comments so we can refine the plan and make it what you know, within the constraints of what it is, how it can best serve the community. Um, the purpose of Home ARP is to reduce homelessness and increase housing stability. It is a one-time opportunity to fill gaps in the homelessness ecosystem. So this is a one-time one opportunity. The funds need to be used and dispersed by 2030. And so we like to talk a little bit about what is the homelessness ecosystem? Um, how does it serve uh, the population in our community? Um, basically, unstably housed individuals enter the system and there can be prevention efforts that put them back into stable housing. Or if they're homelessness, they may go into kind of the different types of housing being um, temporary, temporary housing, um, permanent housing, I mean, then underneath all of these is all the supportive services that uh, a lot of organizations in our community do, but they support people from when they present to the system, come into the system, um, all the way through, and even when they're stably housed, with the goal of you know, providing the supports that allow for the independence and stability long term. One of the things we're tasked with is assessing where are the needs and gaps, and there is a lot of good work going on in the community, but there are some really important needs and gaps that would help round out um, reduce and what the services and facilities offered and also reduce homelessness and housing insecurity in Wichita. And those would be prevention and diversion programs, temporary housing, some permanent housing, and expanded case management, housing navigators, outreach, and others. Uh, one thing I want to note is on here we have substance abuse and mental health treatment. And there is um, both the city and county are working on a, a joint facility um, that hopefully can be related to a navigation center, but we don't know. So there is a lot of community conversation on better meeting those needs um, in the near future. We also looked at the statistics on um, how many people are served in the homeless system today, um, how long they stay in, in the system, how many return back to homelessness versus uh, move to permanent housing, um, and, and so forth. And you know, one of the things is this, this data is imperfect, and the, the community is working on a better system to kind of track and understand who's getting what services at different points um, in, in the system of need and care. And so really, we're, we're tr we tried to ask the questions, answer the questions through this process. What's the best use of these funds? What would be most impactful in the community knowing that the funds are, it's a one-time opportunity? Um, what would align with best practices? Um, you know, leveraging the current system to, to, you know, better work toward the goal of reducing homelessness and housing insecurity. So what is the, the goal? for Wichita. And so that, that's an overview of what Home Arp is. I want to talk a little bit about you know, what the funds can be used for and who, who can they serve. Um, there's four qualifying populations, and they're defined by HUD as sheltered and unsheltered homeless 
individuals and families, um, including children, um, those who are at risk of homelessness, so they might be facing eviction or have other housing insecurity. It may be a job loss that, that creates financial challenges, a whole uh, suite of challenges that we we've still saw more of during COVID. Um, those fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, sexual assault, or human trafficking, as well as other populations where providing supportive services would prevent homelessness. This could be those with uh, physical or mental disabilities and, and others. The funds can be used for a wide range of, of options. Um, they can be used for the production or preservation of affordable housing, for tenant-based rental assistance, including um, some uh, utility deposits, security deposits, and so forth to help get people into stable housing. Um, almost any supportive services services that you can think of around uh, these populations can be funded and supported through home arp and it can also support non congregate shelters and a little bit more detail about each of these um, in terms of production or preservation of affordable housing it can be new rental housing units it can be renovating and improving existing ones um, it can be used to reinvest or refinance existing affordable housing but that we aren't looking at that um, here in Wichita based on the needs that, that rose to the top. In terms of tenant-based rental assistance, uh, security deposits, utility payments, um, et cetera, can be used, so it's pretty flexible in that regard. A uh, key point is it cannot be used in conjunction with home ownership programs, so it's not intended to help um, households achieve home ownership. Supportive services, uh, we didn't list them all here because we couldn't fit them, but pretty pretty much anything from homelessness prevention, mental health um, treatment, um, ongoing case management, housing navigation, um, all of those services are, are on the list and can be funded. In terms of non-congregate shelter, it's again acquisition or new construction and development. Um, the one caveat is that it will not fund operations and HUD is um, when they're reviewing applications, they do want to see that if a non-congregate shelter is proposed, that there's some commitment for operations, some ability to fund um, the operations of the shelter. So the needs and gaps. Um, we talked with about 20 or 22 of the organizations doing the work here in Wichita, um, in person and in virtual conversations, one-on-one -on -one with, each, with each organization so we could kind of get to the root of, of what the pe people doing the work saw as the needs, gaps, and priorities. Um, and what rose to the top were several things. And a quick note on this graphic is those highlighted in turquoise are, um, Home Arp can fund them. Those that are kind of hatched, turquoise and black, um, could partially be funded or qualify for Home Arp funding. So what rose to the top was really non-congregate shelters for single women, case managers, housing navigators, and outreach, more staff doing the work, um, homelessness prevention and diversion, uh, landlord education and engagement to get more uh, landlords accepting vouchers, uh, which is a, a really critical challenge in the community. There are vouchers going unused right now because people cannot find suitable housing units. Um, safe, affordable housing units, uh, funds for paying utilities, back rent, et cetera. And then there was a lot of conversation about quality of housing units. Um, if there is renovation of those units home, for affordable housing, Home Arp does apply, but, but there's like some elements that would not qualify. In terms of mental health facilities, Home Arp will not fund a mental health facility, but can fund the services provided there. We also had a, a survey of providers to kind of see what rose to the top so we could kind of track it with some data. Um, what rose to the top in terms of qualified populations that have the largest gap in services, uh, mental health disorders, uh, populations dealing with those challenges rose to the top, um, as well as those dealing with addiction and substance abuse, um, just generally the sheltered and unsheltered homeless population as well as those at risk of being at homelessness, um, followed by single women. The priority needs in terms of what 
what um, the funds could support more to fill those gaps, supportive services, affordable housing units, nonprofit operating, operating funding, and non-congregate shelters are the top four, um, followed by tenant-based rental assistance and again, nonprofit capacity building. And then in terms of which specific supportive services are in most need, case management rose to the top, uh, followed by homeless prevention, housing counseling, and then life skills training and job readiness. So kind of some themes really emerged from the conversations and the survey that um, people participated in. And then we looked at, we partnered with Homebase, which is a national firm that supports capacity building and homeless solutions across the country. Um, really, what are the best practices? We, want, we looked at low barrier housing focused shelter, prevention and diversion, which are, are different, um, and landlord outreach specifically. So it's focusing on connecting people to the service that they, services they need uh, to get to sta stable housing with the intent of reducing shelter time. Focus on preventing at-risk household, households from entering homelessness. Focusing on quickly connecting people who lose housing with resources to get them back on their feet and housed. And then um, funding more out, uh, advocates for tenants, uh, more available units, um, maybe some protections and assurances for landlords so that there are, they have people to talk to when there's challenges and to get some more support and more units available uh, for those in, in these challenging situations. And so we processed a lot of this information, had a lot of conversations with Homebase and with the city team um, to kind of come to these recommendations. And I want to first talk about uh, what the original concept was and talk about the kind of amended recommendation. So what we're trying to do is fund a single, single project that accomplishes all of these goal, many of these goals. It would include a navigation center to connect those with services, the services they need in one place, non-congregate shelter um, with at least a portion serving women specifically in a, in a you know, safe and protected manner, and affordable housing units. Uh, we kind of allocated the funds that the city received for these different uses. And um, there, you know, some of the funds, up to 15%, can be used for administration um, per HUD rules. If the city does not use all of those to administer and monitor the program, they can go back to these other uses. Um, so, and then the revised concept and is that the city would find a site or facility and, and create this facility, be the developer. They would look for partners to develop, operate, manage, and provide the supportive services. Um, for now, we've, we've kept the distribution of the funds the same. There is some leeway in HUD guidelines that these can be adjusted based on the needs as the pro a project moves forward. Um, one caveat is that what's written in the plan right now is that if, if this does not come to fruition in a year, um, a new RFP or NOFO, notice of funding availability uh, opportunity would be issued and applicants can apply for any of these programs in a single project. So, it does, so you could apply for non-congregate shelter or supportive services or affordable housing units. So it's not, won't, it won't be required to be one facility. Um, some of the key challenges to this approach is the need to find a site or building and you know they're looking at a couple options today. Uh, one of the big concerns um, for almost everybody we talked to who would consider a non-congregate shelter is the need to secure ongoing funding for operations. Um, and then aligning other funding sources, there, there is opportunity, particularly with the city leading the charge, to um, have access to some state resources, tax credit funding, and others, but it takes time and expertise to align all these um, in the right ways to get the project done. Other considerations, we have received some feedback so far. There is a survey out there, um, we encourage anybody to take it, that just helps get feedback on these different ideas. 
um, we, we heard that funding should be directed to tenant-based rental assistance. And um, the reason no funding was allocated toward that is because there are um, vouchers being unused in the community today because there aren't affordable housing units. Um, a couple of months ago when we presented to council, there were 137 um, vouchers reserved for homelessness that were going unused. And there's more for just the general population because of the limitation of affordable housing units. So we prioritize affordable housing units over rental assistance. We also heard uh, to increase the amount of funding for supportive services. And this is something we really wrestled with because of the need. Um, we, we thought that, and we welcome comment and challenging this, uh, that you know this funding is temporary. So we could fund whatever amount of supportive services and then in three, four years, the funding will go away. So it's not a sustainable source for supportive services that would, could create long-term challenges while there could be uh, really short-term gains. Um, we heard that the city should acquire and rehab an existing building for this. And again, there's concern about the capacity, whether it's the city or an organization to make um, a project that includes these the three different elements um, happen and fund it long term. And so um, that's really an overview of the plan. Uh, we want to get your feedback, have discussion around these, um, which Angeline will help with, but really understand what are your concerns? Do you agree with this approach? Why or why not? Um, this is the time to refine this and think about making these funds most impactful for the community. One of the great one of the benefits of how HUD rolled this out is there is time to execute this, but we also understand there's a tension with the need in the community. So um, there is a need to do it well and to try to do something that would have lasting impact um, for the community, but um, you know, we, we want to get this right. So from here, this is the second public meeting. Um, this will go um, to council which will be a public hearing and will end the public comment session on December 6th. Then hopefully if it gets through council and um, the recommendation is accepted, I will submit to HUD in late December and then start moving forward early, early next year. So with that, um, we're happy to answer qual clarifying questions. Um, otherwise, Angeline's going to kind of lead some discussion. There we go. What the administrative costs, eight hundred twenty-six thousand two hundred fifty-five. But earlier, it said that money couldn't go towards administrative costs of a shelter. So, what does that number mean and do? Um, that is for the city to administer the program over the next seven years to to make sure. You know, so they wouldn't be involved in running a shelter or that would have to be someone else but as far as the implementation of that that's where that money would go is that correct yes okay, okay. Okay, so we really want to have a discussion so the four of you are all on the hot seat okay <laughs> so we want to start off with again we we for those of you who are part of the virtual we're going to continue uh, with asking the same questions and having some deeper dive conversations on really getting your perspectives on what's been proposed um, and what this will look like moving forward so the the first thing we want to really draw out is do you agree with the focus on a single project that provides a navigation center, non-congregate shelter, and affordable housing units? And then why if you do, or why not if you do not? 
So I'm going to give you time. Um, on your tables are post-its. If you've been in any of my facilitated conversations before, you know I love post-its. So our post-its where I'm going to ask that you write down your thoughts clearly so that I can read and distinguish them. But write down your thoughts on if you agree with the focus on a single project that provides and the questions are up there as well, that provides a navigation center, non-congregate shelter, and affordable housing units, why or why not? And I'm asking you to be as, as detailed as possible about your thoughts. I'm going to give you some time to share them, use as many stickies as you need. We really want and need your feedback, and then we'll have some conversation about your responses. So let's say six minutes. Let's see. Say about six, five, six minutes. So for the sake of our recording, I'll repeat the ask. So in addition to your own thoughts and perspectives, please share what you feel perhaps you have already heard from your colleagues or what you think some of the sentiments of your colleagues would be with regards to this in our coming questions as well. And please jot those down. Feel free to use a sticky per idea or bullets if they're separate ideas. I'm going to guesstimate. We have about three minutes left. I would also ask, kind of in the vein of this question, since the plan has been amended for the, the city leading the development of this facility, do you think that's a good idea? Um, the, the plan has changed to where the recommendation is that the, the city would develop this facility, you know, and look for partners to operate it. Um, is that a good idea? Would like your feedback on that as well. And with that, I'll add one more minute. So we're down to two minutes.
Okay, let's hear what some of the feedback is. So do we have any volunteers who want to start us off? Okay. In regards to the first question, a single project focus, yes. And um, I'll see a lot of the, all those that we've listed up there in the navigation, non congregate shelter and affordable housing, they're all gaps I think have been identified in our community. Um, um, we need inpatient treatment for substance abuse, but I saw that that's, that can't be money used for that. So that's off the plate. So I get that. Um, priorities around the homelessness and housing and security um, that doesn't ex address, that's what, you know, inpatient beds. Um, and the distribution of the funds, uh, I think, is good. And to answer your question, um, I, I do believe that, the, you know, the city should try to fund those things from a um, um, setting. I'm trying to forget get the word right, but I don't think they should be necessarily be involved in running the shelters. So I think I think that's the step in the right direction to fund the making the building uh, or buying one, and then have another agency run it, and then maybe offer a startup grant or something like that just to get someone in the door. Because some, you know, a lot of these agencies they they lack funds and to uh, administratively run something that at first could cost a lot. So that might be something for the city to look at. Um, when your questions about what other agencies uh, would say something differently, I do. I think everyone, all the different providers, do different things. Some just work with mentally ill people. Some are just like substance abuse, and they don't have the experience of, of trying to help someone na navigate through affordable housing or trying to help them get into a shelter. I think probably humankind is one that comes that, that does all three. So they have a lot of experience in that from shelter, they have outreach, and they have affordable housing that they help people with. But a lot of uh, providers don't do that. And so their their, fo their um, focus and understanding of the problem, I think, would be a little bit more limited. So thank you. Thank you for that. And Officer Nate took the approach of addressing all three of the questions, too. So thank you for that. We want to be able to do a deep dive for all of them. So I want to focus in on the first question and the stickies. That, that's OK. The stickies that you may have related to the first question. So that way we can have some really hearty conversation and dialogue around each um, versus jumping to all three. So for the first question, Officer Nate, did you one of your stickies apply? Well, I just kind of read everyone my right now. Ah, okay, so I have homework for you. <laughs> Anyone else, uh, can you address the first one? Could you separate your back of the put a bunch in your own respective uh, big sticky so we can individualize responses? How many people are we talking about trying to serve on any one day and a single navigation center? It seems like it might be too small to deal with the situation. And a non-congregate shelter, what would it, how would it work exactly? Would, would, would your people stay there? I, I, just, I don't quite understand what it, how, how that would help. <laughs> um. Non-congregate shelter, it's not meant to be housing. It really is that stop. I mean, if you think about a congregate shelter and you've got people lined up in cots, the real difference is people are in individual rooms where they can store their belongings, um, no fear of being assaulted, or interrupted, all of that. So it really is just taking um, what is in a congregate, maybe have cots in a room and putting people in individual rooms that have an individual bathroom they don't have to have kitchen facilities. Now that definition comes from HUD as to what constitutes non-congregate shelter. Well, how big would it need to be then? If we're talking 1,400 people, that's... <laughs> yeah, no, there's, I mean, there's not the intent. There's in the high rises. <laughs> yeah. um, the non-congregate shelter would be a piece in the in the homeless ecosystem because there are congregate shelters, non-congregate shelters. There's temporary, you know, housing. There's transitional housing. There's permanent supportive housing. There are a whole slew, or ca as I call a cafeteria, of of different resources available. And one of the key things about a navigation center is really trying to align um, and identify people's needs to get them placed um, in the appropriate type of solution. And oftentimes. 
that starts with shelter, whether that's congregate. We don't have a non-congregate right now. Um, it is a new thought. It really came out of COVID. Um, we had the opportunity to tour a non-congregate shelter yesterday in Omaha uh, to get a you know better idea of how those operate. And it is um, we saw some really promising results. Um, from, you know, humanizing and getting people in a safe space. Um, you know, I often say to people, think about it, how safe, how could you focus on your other issues when you're lying on a cot next to somebody and don't know if you're going to be safe overnight, even if it is in a shelter. I'm not saying our shelters are necessarily dangerous, right? They're, they're uh, manned very, very well, but things happen, and people have their own barriers and their own issues to address. I, I talked to one woman who said she would never take her child into one of the shelters because she was too worried. Too afraid. She couldn't sleep because she was so worried that someone would harm her or her, or harm her, child, her child first, right? Yeah, so there's not any intent to try and build a facility that's going to hold 1,400 people. To be honest with you, the end result, the best result is moving people into housing and trying to get our whole ecosystem into a position where somebody enters shelter, it is temporary, short term, so that they can get whatever issues they need, whether that's ID, whether that's connection to mental health services, whatever they need that can help them move to that next level. And that other that type of housing is very different from each individual circumstance. A rapid rehousing solution, a permanent supportive housing solution, and trying to identify what those are. So shelter is the last, honestly, in the last thing I'd ever really want to fund. I want to see more housing. If, if homelessness is solved through housing, we just know we don't have enough and we need more than just housing. We've learned over the years, you can't take someone who's necessarily take someone who's experiencing homelessness and just put them in an apartment. There are so many other complications and, and barriers and services that they need in order to really be successful. Because we, that's been tried. It has been tried. Just take them out of, off the street and put them in housing. Are they successful? No. And so this kind of helps create that um, more resources in our community, but not meant, yeah, a 1,400 <laughs> non-congregate shelters like a, that would be like student housing in a university somewhere. <laughs> yeah. that First of all, that 1,400 is, is the amount of people that come into homelessness and leave. They could have been homeless for one day and then get counted. Oh, if you look at the homeless point in time count, which is what we count, like how many homes, if you had a magnet and you pulled up all the homeless, we're running roughly around 600 a year. So, um, but that's spread out between families and and veterans over here and all the different shelters. Our our biggest shelter for men, I think they run around 100, 150 with people in the program. And I don't know what your guys' winter shelter is going to be looking like this year, but um, but that's kind of what the numbers look like on top of that. Are are we talking at all about addressing the needs of the of the mentally ill in terms of providing shelter that has uh, supervision? For, sort of like the community um, stuff that MHA runs. Oh, absolutely. I mean, su supervision and, and being properly staffed is, is definitely key in operating any shelter. Um, but yet, the, the idea is to try and bring together those additional resources. And like I said, every person's individual needs are different. It may be mental health. It may be substance abuse. It may be both. It might be, you know, might have medical barriers. And, and being able to do that one-on-one -on -one assessment and not think that, you know, round pegs or square peg, round hole, everybody doesn't ha need the same resources. Um, and just trying to figure out a way through the Navigation Center to tie people to the resources that they need to, in order to be successful. And, and if we may, because that really ties into the second question that I want us to do a deep dive on, if we could focus on the, this first question and whether or not there's agreement on having a single project that captures all three elements or a preference of having multiple projects that capture the different elements? I think, the, in my opinion, having multiple people trying to, to do the same thing would lead to confusion and a, and a real opportunity for somebody to be told one thing at one place and something else at another, and having a single project would, be more, would keep the focus where it belongs and keep people from getting lost out, out there in the system somewhere. Can you share, are your responses that you wrote down to this first question? No. Okay. Can you, because it's, it's our intent for Andy and I as facilitators to really capture what you are saying on these, on these poster boards um, so we can have a record. So 
If Do you have any that pertain specifically to this first question? And for those of you that haven't had a chance to share yet, um, we're really looking at trying to capture, at capturing your thoughts to this first question on your stickies. And yours are for some of the other questions? Well, they, they were just my questions. <laughs> just questions uh, so, you know, are there enough, do we have enough vacant housing stock? No, I didn't think so. So let, let's, let's take a pause and let's, let's do this. Let's do a, a poll. Do you agree with the focus on a single project that provides a navigation center, non-congregate shelter, and affordable housing units? If you agree with that, can you raise your hand? So we have four participants with all four unanimous in agreement with that. Okay, that's our, that's our virtual sticky, <laughs> that there is unanimous agreement on that. And you were speaking to the reason why. You feel like, as you were sharing, that it makes sense to have, versus having different entities doing the same thing, have a singular location. I think, I think we've kind of tried that, and there's no coordination to it. I don't, I, may, I don't know if you can have a navigation center that coordinates everybody's piece, but it would sure be easier to just have one entity that knew what was what. For the other attendees and providers in the room, that do you share in that sentiment with your reason as to why supporting a single location? Yeah. Okay. Biggest. The biggest, one of the problems that we see is we go out and we'll first, uh, we're a navigation, right? We're, we, do, we do referrals and then we have a list of 100 different providers that we utilize. And so we navigate. And then once we get them to the shelter, wherever that may that may be, if we get him there, or maybe he needs to go somewhere else and he needs to navigate and we can't be driving him around doing all this stuff all day long. And then when he gets to the shelter, now he's been there for 30 days, now he's ready to transition to housing or do a housing voucher. And the shelter is saying, we'll call the hot team and have him fill out the paperwork for, for a housing voucher. I don't know if that's appropriate. I think that guy shouldn't be bounced, or he or she should not be getting bounced around through the whole system. And then that becomes frustrating for them. And the next thing you know, they get lost into the system and we see them back out on the streets and now we're starting all over again. And that's, that's what we see a lot happen often. Yeah, so we are a service provider in the homeless um, services space as well as a housing provider as well. And we offer other auxiliary supportive services within our organization and what I would say is you know agreeing that it's incredibly complicated to navigate not only for people that are in social services but then somebody in crisis or that's having trauma to try to you know ping them to different agencies to accomplish a multitude of things that are needed and um, we do agree that co-location um, or one single navigation center, resource center, whatever you guys want to label it as makes sense. And I think a lot of providers in the community have been talking about that for some time. So that's not new language as it relates in our field. Um, where I think it could or could not um, is one single project, a large project that has both navigation, shelter services, and housing w would work. Um, I don't think we're in disagreement, but I do think a standalone housing project with the same you know, denotion of how you guys earmark the funding, I think that could be a standalone if the same provider or providers ran it so that that navigation center could do those warm handoffs to that leasing or however that housing project worked. But as far as it being located in a singular spot, I don't know that it's necessary. So I wouldn't say it's a good or bad idea. What I would say is that it could be split into two different buildings um, and, and as it relates specifically to housing. Now, I do agree that whoever is in management, um, whether that be city, nonprofit or landlord, whomever, I do think that they need to be present, whether it be an office or otherwise in the navigation center. That is the only way that's going to work for it not to be one building. Um, but I do think there's arguments that m my 
colleagues in this space would probably argue there's benefits to not having that housing be in the same exact facility. So there's arguments to be made on both sides. And, and you go, go ahead. I totally agree that I think the housing needs to be maybe just a block down, but it should not be in the same building because if you're a tenant or if you're a client, there's different rules. So if you're a ten, if you're a tenant, you're a resident, you might be able to bring in beer because you're bringing it into your apartment. But if you're a client and it's no alcohol, but on the second floor, you know, it's residents, then that's going to cause another stress level. I think it just makes it harder from a management perspective. Sorry. Sorry, I think it could make it more challenging, not impossible. Um, it would have to be... Um, a different type of housing it, it would you know are we talking about permanent housing where you are stabilized you're in the community you get to make grown adult decisions or are we talking about very much like supportive housing environment where it's an oxford housing where you're not allowed to partake in alcohol consumption or i just think there is management nuances that clearly we're not going to decide or discuss today but one agency or multiple agencies um, or entities would have to really work through the specifics of how you're going to manage um, somebody that is housed I'm no longer homeless, I'm housed, and how are you supporting them versus a client or an overnight guest or somebody like that. So I just think there's some nuances from the management perspective that could be, um, that are gonna require lots of conversations. But nevertheless, fundamentally, do you agree with this concept? Yes, I would say our organization agrees with the concepts. When you get into the nitty gritty of the planning, I think there's gonna be, have to be a multitude of conversations that transpire. And, and you both went exactly where I was going to go and follow up conversation is there's general consensus that we do like the, the congregate, the idea of the singular shop or maybe a secondary housing nearby, but what other aspects of the reality of what this practically looks like should we be mindful of as we're moving forward? So you spoke about the uh, nuances with residents and what rules are and how that comes into play. Are there other things that the city should be mindful of as they're looking at this, this single shop or maybe there's the thought of you know something nearby anything else that you all feel we should be mindful of early in this stage as we're preparing to go before council and present this are you going to cohabitate people with with mental illness problems with say families who don't have i mean are are you going to separate mentally ill people from the rest of the population in terms of of how to provide housing for them. Could you write that down, please? Please capture this on your stickies. I'm not taking the notes real time. <laughs> so please capture your stickies so I can add them. It would be discriminatory for us to say you have a mental health condition, you can't live in our housing. So yes, you would hope that you have set them up with the right resources to deal with whatever their mental health issue is, but it would be a federal, um, you'd be breaking federal law to say, you can't live here because you have a mental health issue. Yeah. Have you visited Clara House on a Saturday night? <laughs> no, I have not, but <laughs> yeah. Maybe you should. <laughs> I don't, I, unfortunately, I don't make the rules. I just know we have to, we have to abide by them. But in, in a properly run and resourced um, environment, the, the folks who might have a disability would be connected to the resources to address their disability, what, no matter what that disability was. Any other questions? Yep. I'm going to ask a question. Okay. What about sex offenders? Sex offenders not determined as a disability. They are not a protected class. The project could um, restrict sex offenders. Now, any type of housing project that would be part of this would likely be under a Section 8 voucher, either project-based or tenant-based, which absolutely restricts sex offenders from occupying. You can separate families, though. 
In the discussions we've had, uh, um, particularly on the the shelter piece, yes, you would separate and have physical barriers between families with children and families or and individuals or couples without children. Any other thoughts or questions about the focus on a single project? Okay, let's go into a deeper dive on the second question. Are there priority needs around homelessness and housing insecurity that this plan does not address? So an earlier comment was a question about mental health, I believe you had earlier. So we know that's one. Can you, okay, you all know how I am with my stickies. You're gonna learn how I am with my stickies. Can you write that, uh, even just put mental health so I can add it up there. Any other topics, or would you like to expound any further on mental health and your concern or question about how it relates to this project? She's writing intensely. Mine is substance abuse, but I already talked about earlier, inpatient Okay, substance abuse, mental health. Okay, I have a group that doesn't like stickies. Andy, can you help me capturing these? <laughs> Any other, we have mental health, we have substance abuse. Anything else that you all feel is not covered in the plan that absolutely needs to be a priority and considered? I don't think it necessarily needs to be in this plan particularly, and I, I think we're probably speaking to a crowd that already knows this very well, but I think in general, um, accessible, affordable housing units. So I know a lot of people talk about just affordable housing and lack of the inventory, but we see a lot of the accessible units, and that's because if somebody is a high-risk renter, I guess is that what you want to call them, if they have an eviction on their record, even if it's or even if it's one and it's from years ago, um, property owners are still not renting to folks, uh, and that is people that are employed, people that have their mental health managed, people that do not have a substance abuse disorder, and yet we still cannot get them into housing. And so I think you know, a larger conversation not related to this maybe, so it might not be helpful. But I do think it needs to be discussed in, in, in the masses and the droves about, number one, we need more units, but number two, we can't just build more units for, you know, the middle class or upper class. We need to build units that are actually designed and accessible for those living in poverty. Um, and I think that conversation needs to ensue after home ARPA maybe is discussed. So, I was going to expand on that too. We, I have a six page document we've been updating for the last 10 years that's affordable housing and most of the places they're like $400 all bills paid and there's openings there. So I love what you said because it's 100% right. It, there, are, there is affordable housing out there. The problem is a lot of people don't want to do section eight or the evictions, or the sex offense issues, or they want three times the, the income for the rent. So all four of those are the biggest barriers, but we have tons of affordable housing. We're Wichita, Kansas. We're not California, New York. It's the accessibility, what exactly you just said, I think. I mean, there could, probably could be more affordable housing, but I think the gaps that we see is what you said. I think another thing that we're seeing is the um, youth, the 18 to 24 year olds. No one wants to rent to them because they have an established credit. Um, and yeah, so I think that this not is necessarily a home ARPA issue, but I do think that this five million dollars, while it's five point five million, which is fantastic, and nobody in this space is going to gripe at that, but five million dollars for any project is not going to go very far. And mm -hmm. um, we have been a part of new projects and programs, and I can tell you that this will maybe fund one singular thing and then you have your sustainability issue and so it's how to stretch this 5.5 I think is going to be a concern if you're saying like how does this plan not address things well I think that a lot of people think this is a lot of money and it is but in perspective of the need mm -hmm. it really is only going to cover a singular th I mean you could design a housing project tomorrow that's 50 units and it's going to be five million dollars um, and that's just the reality so I think everyone's going to have to be really um, oh I think um, realistic is mm -hmm. the word I would use on their expected outcomes as it relates to home ARPA funding so I would just add everyone's 
realistic uh, expectations that are going to be associated with this. Thank you. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. It's both a lot of money and not a lot of money when we're talking about challenges like this. Um, in the plan, uh, we have to do projections of how many units it could support, and you know, we assumed that other funding sources would have to be leveraged. Um, that's easiest for the affordable housing units, easiest in quotes because it's a process to apply for tax credits or home funds or state funds or all of the things. Um, but to make this have an impact, I, I think we said 30 or 40 affordable housing units. Um, and the spreadsheet HUD makes us do, I put $50,000 a unit from the home art funds, which means you need 100,000 from other sources per unit. Um, so absolutely um, really important to, to figure out how to leverage these instead of just maybe just spend them on one thing. Right, and I guess that would be a question that I believe a lot of providers in town, and I can't speak to all of them, but of course we all work really, really closely together because um, it's necessary, a necessity. We work with the hot team every day and others that I, I don't believe could be here today. And so, um, but I, that goes into a question I would pose to the planning group on this is that you're going to be asking providers, um, plural, or a single provider and or entity, company, or otherwise, to do this, to apply for it and implement it with knowing outright that it's going to cost more than what is available in funding. And so there's going to have to either be philanthropy involved, like you said, tax credits or otherwise. And so you're really asking these agencies to do more than what they're already doing. And a lot of them are at full capacity in terms of their bandwidth. So how do we come together as a community to support the many agencies that will be a part of it and or the, you know, let's say there's a select few um, that collaborate on it, how do we do that? Because you're literally asking people to do more than what they're already doing when they're at capacity already. So while it's great, the funding is available, let's say this in a perfect world actually is a $10 million project, let's just say. Now we as a team, and I mean the Wichita team in this space, have to come up with what that looks like because we don't want to do something sort of mediocre, right? Um, you'd rather not do it than not, you know, than not get it right, I guess, because who wants to spend $5 million and not get it right? So I, I guess I would push that back to the planning team. How are you guys handling that conversation and what do you suggest for the providers in the space that might consider um, stepping forward and working with partner agencies on how to get this done? Because that's going to take a Hercules effort. So do you have thoughts on that? You kind of hit why the plan was amended, right? And evaluating it and saying this thing, asking someone, because in the original plan was we're going to issue a NOFO and who's going to come forward to pull this whole thing together? And we said, whoa, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot to try and pull this together. And, and so there's going to need to be that support and that ability to try and leverage other resources and, and, and like you said, get it right. But it is, it's going to be like herding cats in some ways. Uh, in some ways, the funding for capital is the easy side of this, in my opinion. Um, but it is, you know, and something that was talked about, some of the thoughts in, in why one project, one site, is to be able to leverage um, some of those activities against each other, right? Because for me, the non-congregate area shelter Operation support is the biggest gap in the long term. The housing, the housing support, the, the rents should support it if, if done right. Um, the NAV center, depending, uh, if you're just moving activities that are being done here, here, and here, and moving them there, should support, have the means to support those kind of activities. It's that non-congregate piece that's the biggest challenge. I know, like, uh, just yesterday I had a meeting, I'm not going to name any names because it's still in development, but there was a there's an investor, um, 
and he's giving 7.5 acres away to start something like this and with a $4.5 million capital and bring in a hospital that's going to build a hospital on it. So there's our, there's our, our other organizations, I think, are absolutely right that we're going to have to partner. And just this one partner, we got the $10 million just if we the city chose to partner with the, this agency. So, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. There's going to be things like that that we... And we're in that this meeting included city council members and county commissioners that are that are in this plan and look at this as well. And this could maybe be something that merges with that plan. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, I just wanted to um, address one thing though, and then um, I mean I know there's only four of us here, but um, when you guys asked if the government should be involved or manage it or start it, operate it, and then let people be in the facility, I I love my city of Wichita friends and the housing department, and we have good rapport because we couldn't do a lot of the work that we do without good strong partnerships. However, I think that it would be a miss to have that happen. And the only reason that we say that is because it might be really, really slow. Um, I think from a management perspective as like a social worker or a social service, health and human service provider, there are certain things as far as management decisions that need to happen. And I think that the providers should be the ones to get to make those executive decisions, how it pertains, how programs are designed and ran. And I think it would be challenging um, not impossible, but incredibly challenging and time consuming to have a third party entity, whether it be the government or otherwise, um, managing or overseeing or ownership of, and then expect the nonprofits to be in there. I mean, I think that that's going to be incredibly challenging to navigate for all parties, including the government or the city of Wichita. Um, I think that nonprofits could be nimble. They could have, you know, obviously if they're going to be asked to secure philanthropy funding, uh, there's going to be that. I just think that it could be incredibly messy. Um, and I do think that those entities should reserve the right to make executive decisions as it pertains to how those programs and services are ran. Any feedback or thoughts to what has was just shared? Do others agree with that concern? Do you have other concerns? Okay. You can put on your sticky anonymous too. So the, the third question and final question, we have about 25 minutes maybe remaining, um, is do you agree, and we've already really touched on this, do you agree with the distribution of funds among support services, non congregate shelter, and affordable housing? If not, how should the funds be allocated? I put the slide back up showing the breakdown, um, or the proposed breakdown, but as Andy shared, there's some flexibility here. Um, this is just a suggested uh, distribution of funds. Are there any thoughts or perspectives on what's being proposed here? No. Can you put it, say it in the mic? Sorry. So we have priced out some of these projects in years past just because we do a lot of this work. And so we have the historical knowledge. And Roxanne's been with our organization for 27 years, so she should probably do the talking. But we've done... Um, projects with tax credits. We've done housing projects with um, as capital campaigns. Uh, we run different shelters. And, and so just we have some historical content, even in recent years, um, fairly recent. And I'm just my knowledge alone. If a developer came in and said something different, I would respect their expertise in it. But our knowledge as an organization, you're just, I'm, I'm going to say this, but it's not a matter of fact, so please forgive me, but you're just never going to get it done for that price. So if you're looking at 30 units in affordable housing complex and you want it to be you know, permanent supportive housing, so let's say you have staff 24 hours or you have case management or any of those things, $2.1 million dollars you're not going to get far. In fact, I would think you would maybe have like 15 units and it would be fairly small. So... Um, 
I, I just think in general, the numbers, if you're wanting to pull off something in its entirety, you'd have to dump all the 5.5 into one of these projects or you're going to have to expect that significant funding is going to come from other sources. So, You hit it. Significant. This is probably 20% of what we think is going to take to get this done. Yeah. So have you guys done that cost analysis and is that available for review? N not officially, no. You have to identify the site, the scope. You know, the site's a big piece of it. Are we talking, like you said, 15 units? Or are we talking 100 units? Right. Are we talking how many shelter rooms, um, you know, nav center, the whole nine yards? And that's why I say it, it's going to be significantly north of this. Right. Okay. Well, as long as it's been acknowledged, then that's, then I, I didn't, I didn't expect that it wasn't, Sally, but I just had to say it out loud. You asked the question. So, um, I do have a, a question as it related to your presentation. You said that the RFP would be available for a year. Did I get that wrong? Um, how is that? Can you explain the timeline to, to us? Um, the way it's written is, um, to give this approach a year. And if other funding sources and, and all of the partnerships don't come to fruition, you know, the responses to operate, the response to manage it, a reasonable developer to work with um, to get it built, um, then um, basically the, that concept would be scrapped and the funds would be re- the, NOFO RFP would be reissued to say, give us your proposal for one of these, or combined, you know, give us your best proposal for these items. It doesn't have to be in a single project. Um, so the intent is to, I mean, acknowledge that it's an incredibly challenging endeavor. It's challenging in a year. Um, as you all know, an affordable housing project can take five years to come to fruition. Um, so it's, it's an effort to try for something like this that we think and the best practices kind of show can have a major impact in the community, um, but also acknowledge that it might not come together be because uh, you're absolutely right. Even five and a half might not do one of the things completely. Um, so it's kind of reaching for that something bigger and holistic, hopefully. And if that doesn't work, then moving on and getting the funds into the community for, for projects that make an impact. Yes, that's, that's the current recommendation going to city council. Some of that comes, um, some of the perspective on that. And I do absolutely get what you're talking about as far as managing the shelter piece, the housing piece. Could be two different entities, could be one different entity. But that NAV Center, having one, having one nonprofit organization coming to lease terms and occupancy agreements with possibly 20 different organizations seems like a huge stretch for a nonprofit versus government. And, I'll, and I, I've said it before, we're getting out of the property management business, the city is, right? We hired a property manager for, you know, for the, for the RAG conversion, the public housing units. We don't operate shelter. We have no intention of operating shelter. It's more about being able to bring the capacity and, and tap into other revenue sources and funding sources to try and make this thing happen. And I did pose this. this. This is the dream. And that's the why the one year. Give, you know, we have till 2030 to expend the funds. Give us a year to try and get something that's going to make a huge, massive impact for, in, for our community. And we recognize that might not happen. And if it doesn't, well, what's plan B? Well, maybe someone comes in and says, well, we can do NAV and non-congregate, right? Or we can do NAV and housing. Or we can just do housing. It, we're open to that for sure. But we're like, let's at least take a swing. Okay. 
So thank you all for your comments and thank you for your, your, your candor, your openness to ask those questions and make those comments as needed because we are in the, looking at the schedule of how we are moving this forward. We're in the public comment period. So I've been making jokes about the yellow stickies, but they really are important. Um, so I am actually going to grab all of them that you have shared your thoughts on. They can go on the white one. I'll, sort, I'll let you know which of the questions they're pertaining to. Um, we'll sort through them, but we want to capture your thoughts and your perspectives and your ideas and your questions um, as a part of this public comment period. As we've already discussed, this is going to go before council. We're anticipating on December 6th, and what will go before council is going to be informed by this process and by your comments and by this conversation. So we have 15 more minutes allocated for today's uh, in-person session. Really want to open it up to further thought, questions, dialogue um, to be captured. Because again, our, the next stage is we're preparing to take this before council, again, being informed by what we're hearing from, from opportunities like this one. So I am going to put the mic down and give you all time to kind of think and process on any other questions, uh, things to capture on the stickies. And again, I'll come around and capture um, what you have written already. but. Do provide other thoughts or questions or suggestions or things that you know is going to be important for the city to be mindful of as they're preparing to move this forward to council and preparing to engage in this work. So with that, I'm going to pause for a minute or so, give you all time to think. And there will be mics on each table to just re-enter into dialogue about anything that is pressing that you want to make sure that the city is aware of. And even if you just have a question that you want us to be mindful of, you can add those two and we'll capture those. And again, you can, of course, speak from your perspective or also if you have context from your colleagues, um, perspective from your colleagues maybe that you can share, feel free to add that as well. I do want to add a couple things. Um, this is the public comment period. We do want to hear if what's out there is not the best idea and why. Um, in the plan, we have to document feedback we received, but also feedback we received and did not make a recommendation from and explain why. So, like, um, right now, this is what we're thinking, but in a couple of weeks it could, um, I guess that is a couple of weeks away, um, it could emerge to be back to the original or a modified version, but but that's, I just wanted to, to state that this is still, um, there is room to um, amend things further. Again, to get the best opportunity for it, something um, hopefully transformational and helpful, at least, um, done. Okay, well, I do not see any more pins moving, so are there any closing thoughts from the city or closing comments from city? I want to thank you for coming. 
Your input is very, very important. We don't pretend to have all the answers with this. We really don't. But we do want to take the opportunity to maximize the impact for our community. It could have been, you know, and, and I reference back and if you don't know, Humankind was our partner, or is the operator of, of the studios. We couldn't have had made that happen, um, and it has made a significant impact in our community. And when we looked at what other communities were doing with their CDBG CARES money and their ESG CARES money, um, oftentimes we saw most other communities were putting people in hotels and paying 100 bucks a night per person. And we said, let's look at trying to do something that's going to have a lasting impact in our community that's going to serve, yes, 54 people at a time. How many times is that going to turn over? How many lives is that going to affect? And we actually have an asset here for our community. So that was kind of the same thought when this um, pot of funds Came, came into play. And as our discussion started and, and we went with the idea that we would issue a NOFO and the, and the city wasn't going to help lead that way, um, I, I leaned on my experience with humankind and the, and the studios. And okay, we, this is how we could do it. And it was really thoughts and pushback and ideas and going, well, maybe there is this need for the city to, to, to bring in some additional capacities, to bring in some other resources, to be able to facilitate that navigation center, to have the ability from HUD to say, I'm just magically placing project-based vouchers on this project because we own it, we can do that. When we don't own it, we have to go through a process. You know, so there are some things that can, that can really help facilitate that. In the end, again, I do look at this as this is our opportunity to try and hit a home run. I'm, I'm wise, I know it might not all come together. And if it doesn't, we need plan B. And plan B, you know, can, we can look at, at trying to attack this from different angles. But that's where we are. And that's I wanted to be very transparent on, on the change, on, on the change on who would be leading, leading the project. So. But thank you so much for being here. Please continue if you think of other things. This is not the end of it. You have further thoughts or further comments, you can go to our website. You can email Mark. Who, this is Mark back here. He's the one who'd be receiving. Mark, M. Stanberry at wichita.gov. Um, the plan is uploaded on, on our website if you want to sit down and read through the whole thing. So thank you very much for being here.